Welcome to a Great Mystery Presentation. Following the session, be sure to visit us online at greatmystery.org. You've been listening to the music written by John Perry Barlow, former lyricist for the Grateful Dead, and co-founder of a very excellent organization that's doing tremendous work called the Electric Frontier Foundation. Since May of 1998, he's been a fellow at Harvard Law School's Berkman Center for Internet and Society, following a term as a fellow with the Institute of Politics at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. He was born in Wyoming in 1947 and was educated there in a one-room schoolhouse and graduated from Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut with an honors degree in comparative religion in 1969. John Perry Barlow could be described as an outspoken advocate for opening technology information as an avenue to create needed changes as a form of conscious evolution, understanding, freedom, and community. In an excellent uh, newly released book, Digital Aboriginal, by Michaela Tarlow and Philip Tarlow, by the way, who will be joining us at the Florida Keys Conference, they say that, quote, Barlow is definitely one of the ringleaders of the information just wants to be free crowd. What I do here is uh, talk for a while and kind of define the parameters of the discourse that we might have, and then I hope we can, we can have a conversation. Um, we're somewhat limited by the fact that we are making a tape of the, these proceedings, and if you have something to say that, that you don't say into the talking stick, then it doesn't get recorded. So. Uh, we're going to have to pass around the electronic eagle feather and try to make it a, a conversation in spite of that fact. Uh, but, I, but I'll start out and, and then and I'll let you know when I think that I've, I've said as much as I want to say and I want to hear something from you. Um, I want you to start out by thinking about what mind is. I years ago read a book by a fellow named Gregory Bateson. Anybody hear of Bateson? I, I, hope you, I hope you will try to keep this guy's memory and work alive because it's very important. Uh, but one of the things that, that Bateson said in Steps to an Ecology of Mind and the, the title itself is, is very instructive is that he did not know what the boundaries of mind were. He didn't know where his mind left off and someone else's took up. And if you thought about all the matrices of cultural understanding and filtration and uh, combined perception of reality and the consensus that goes into making that thing that we call reality, it becomes increasingly obvious that mind is not something that you could honestly say, you have. I mean, the term my mind is oxymoronic in the extreme, uh, though this is not widely known. Uh, also, you know, as, as we learn more about the, the nature of the universe, I mean, the, the, current, the current research into into physics indicates that mind is a fundamental part of that which makes up the very uh, substrate of existence. That mind is interwoven into the universe in such a way that the universe cannot exist without it. Uh, and so it is a universally distributed thing. I think that the thing that that we think of as the mind, the brain, uh, is to a large extent merely a, like a radio receiver or transceiver. It's something that is able to pick up mind, and if it's damaged, naturally, uh, you know, it gets a garbled signal. But uh, I, I think of the mind as being largely, I, I say I think, it's, it's impossible to talk without lying, unfortunately. <laughs> but. It thinks <laughs> that mind is everywhere. Now, that's one, one of the things that I want you to, to be in consideration of. 
The other, and, and I'm, I have a feeling that, that there is probably about the same percentage of you who have read the works of Teilhard de Chardin. Yeah? Yeah, about the same percentage. Old hippies. Uh, I, I read Teilhard de Chardin just about the same time I dropped acid, so I, uh, and, the, and, they, and they, they went together like jello and whipped cream, let me tell you. In, in spite of the fact that Teilhard de Chardin was uh, a Jesuit theologian and paleontologist who wrote most of what he wrote in the 30s and uh, was actually a very, very good paleontologist. He, is, he discovered Peking man, and he was an evolutionary theorist who did a lot of good work in evolutionary theory. But he wrote a series of books in the 30s which he was not allowed to publish by the church because they were considered to be heretical uh, and were published posthumously in about 1956, including The Phenomenon of Man, uh, The Omega Point, several other books that I strongly recommend. And what Tyard said was that evolution was a process, a teleological or directed process, that was headed to a point where it would become conscious of itself. That, you know, starting with, starting at the most fundamental level, the evolutionary layers had layered themselves up to the point where they were now expanding beyond what they could organize in long strings of carbon atoms and we're creating a collective organism of mind on this planet. A, a, a brain made out of all of us. And that seemed incredibly persuasive to me. It, it, felt, it felt like it might be something that already existed. Uh, and then I went off and was a cattle rancher in Wyoming for 17 years and didn't think much more about it until... Uh, one day in 85 when I wanted to find out what, it, what, what was really going on among deadheads. <laughs> so I was thinking about community. I was thinking about the fact that, that it seemed like uh, community, as I knew it, in my little town in Wyoming was going away, and the deadheads seemed to have a community in spite of there not being a locus and a focus in the usual sense of the word. There wasn't, there wasn't a small town. There wasn't a place of random interaction, except for these, these sort of serial realities, the, the brigadoon that would erupt every time there was a Grateful Dead concert. And, and also, I, couldn't, I didn't feel like I could learn much about the deadheads because as soon as they found out who I was, it was sort of Heisenbergian anthropology. Uh, the observer would change the observation. And somebody said, well, you, could, you can find out a lot about them online. I said, what's that? Well, it turned out that there was this thing called the ARPANET. Uh, and there were a lot of, it was mostly for defense contractors to exchange uh, military information, but there were a lot of deadheads online on the ARPANET. In fact, some of the first, it turns out, some of the first non-military information that was, was exchanged on the ARPANET were Grateful Dead lyrics. Uh, so I got, I got, on, I got a, an ARPANET account. And the first time I, I saw the, 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 what seemed like enormous conversation that was going on there, at a point when it was actually, I don't suppose there were more than 250,000 people online, maybe 300,000. I had this vision that this was the nervous system that Tired de Chardin had been talking about. And this thing would grow and eventually would become something that connected every living synapse on the planet, and I still believe that. Which is a profound event. I mean, I, I really believe that in human terms, and I, and I don't, when I say the internet, I mean that thing that started in 1847 when, when Samuel F.B. Morris tapped out what hath God wrought and somebody else wrote, read it simultaneously 47 miles away. I mean the ability to be present at a distance. 
But this sequence of events, simultaneous mental presence at distance, is the most, the most profound technological event that has happened to human beings since the capture of fire and will ultimately change practically everything. But what really is happening here, in my view, is that we are explicitly creating an ecosystem that is largely still invisible to us because we're still walking around saying things like, my mind. And we don't think about what ideas are. In my view... There is no useful distinction to be drawn between an idea and a life form. An idea is a pattern of information which is capable of self-reproduction and evolution and and mutation to adjust itself to local uh, um, conditions. When I started thinking about that, thanks to the work of a, of a fellow named Richard Dawkins, who now recants it, by the way. Uh, he came up with the idea of the meme, which was like the mental gene. Uh, and he's a biologist, and I think the biological community took him harshly to task, and now, he, now uh, the last time he and I tried to discuss this, we almost got in a fist fight. Uh, but I, I went to, at one point, I went to uh, James Watson after I started thinking about this. And I said, I want to talk to you about non-carbon-based life. And he said, oh, no, you don't. (laughs) I I guess he'd seen my kind before. Uh, And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, I'm an old man, and carbon-based life is so complex that it's, it's all I can think about for the rest of my life. And I said, all right, define life for me then. And he defined it exactly as I just did. He said, it's a pattern of information which is capable of self-reproduction and evolution. So if you, if you look at ideas and the creatures of mind in this way, you realize that there also isn't much difference between a culture and an ecosystem. And that what you have developing, and, and, and what, what's been developing for a long time, I mean, this is, you can, you can go all the way back to the very dawn of, of human consciousness, and you can see the first, the first beginnings of this ecosystem that we don't recognize. But now that ecology is becoming very dense, thanks to all this new nervous system that's being wired into it. And we have an environment that we don't recognize that we are taking increasingly bad care of. I mean, the state of mental ecology is about the same as biological or conventionally biological ecology was before Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. When I was growing up in Wyoming, my father, who was a good man, nevertheless believed that nature was uh, an implacable foe uh, that could never be bested in any event and could occasionally be wrestled into a state of short-term submission. Uh, he was one of the people who, who signed the document that created the Glen Canyon Dam. He was on the Colorado River Water Commission. And that was the prevailing view before Rachel Carson. Believe it or not, I think everybody, everybody thought that human beings were simply incapable of having such a profound effect on the environment. And, and, and nobody knew that there was an environment to have a, a, a profound effect on. I mean, we were all, we were all wandering around in this relatively ignorant state. It's kind of like uh, Bertrand Russell once said, we don't know who discovered water, but we're pretty sure it wasn't a fish. (laughs) Well, we were wandering around breathing the air and, and giving little thought to the fact that we were changing it. And we were drinking the water and giving little thought to the fact that we were changing that. 
and certainly giving little thought to the, to, the, to the idea that the whole thing was one giant organism that could be profoundly affected by our, our misdeeds or short-sightedness. And we're still just beginning to figure that out. But cyberspace has happened very quickly. I mean, from, from that point in 1985, when I think, as I say, there were 250,000 people online, I think there are probably, at this stage, close to a billion people on the planet who have some way of accessing the Internet. And by the year 2010, I think, I think it's safe to say that if you want to get electronic mail to anybody who's alive, it will be possible to do. Then, if things are lucky, we will have a huge social space in which all those creatures of mind have enormously extended range and a density of ecological interaction that will take what has been essentially a desert and turn it into, into the most beautiful rainforest imaginable. We'll have a world where any thought that has robustness ca capable of being reproduced and spreading will be able to spread into every mind that wishes to hold it. Where anybody anywhere can say whatever they think and pass that idea on to anybody else anywhere else at zero cost. And nobody will be able to stop them. That's if we're lucky. But unfortunately, the same folks that want to use all the world's resources in the next 20 or 30 years also want to plunder, despoil, control, and lock up cyberspace. And are rushing in there with ravenous energy, trying to make certain that there is nothing in cyberspace that cannot become their property. That believe that ideas can be owned in what I think is the most insidious imaginable form of slavery. I want to actually, let me read something to you wasn't going to do this, but he says it so beautifully that I, I think you ought to hear it. By the way, you know, interestingly enough, inside this room, I have high-speed internet connection, wireless internet connection. I don't know who's providing it, but I'm grateful to them. I just discovered this. I was really pleased. So I can look this quote up online. Thomas Jefferson said, if nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea, which an individual may exclusively possess as long as he keeps it to himself, but the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone, and the receiver cannot dispossess himself of it. Its peculiar character, too, is that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. That ideas should spread freely from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of humankind and improvement of our condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature 
when she made them like fire, expansible over all space, without lessening their density at any point. And like the air in which we breathe, move, and have our physical being, incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation. Inventions, then, cannot in nature be subject to property. Somebody should tell that to Jack Valenti. And Hillary Rosen. And, and everybody who's involved in the content industry, who is now in ways that are probably largely invisible to you, trying to eliminate the very idea of the library, the idea that you can make non-commercial use and share non-commercially ideas. And this will have the most devastating possible effect on the ecology of cyberspace, if they prevail in this. And, they are, and they're working on prevailing in this, and they're so serious about it that they are changing the technological architecture of the online environment and, and your computer. I mean, they're, uh, Microsoft and Intel are now working on something called trusted computing, <laughs> it's where they can trust your computer and you can't, uh, so that you cannot have any copyrighted material on your computer that you haven't paid for, and you cannot share anything with anybody that is copyrighted. And this is really going on, and, and unfortunately, people are, are not incensed about it, and I hope you will become so. Because, because it would be like going down to the Amazon and bulldozing out large swaths of fire break and putting up tall fences about every 400 yards. It would have a very bad effect on that ecosystem. I guess they're probably doing that anyway, but... Uh, you see, you see my point. There is also a move underway to take all the information that's in cyberspace and turn it to the purposes of surveillance. There's a fellow named John Poindexter. Does anybody remember John Poindexter? Uh, John Poindexter was, uh, was Reagan's national security advisor, and I thought we'd seen the last of him after he was convicted of six felonies in 1990 and sent to jail. But no, he's a resourceful guy, and he's back with something called the Office of Information Awareness, which under the, under the principles of the USA Patriot Act make it possible for the United States government to have access to any commercial or private or public database in the United States without a warrant and without an actual intended subject of investigation, combine all those data in one great big soup and start using very powerful computers, the same ones that are no longer being used to design nuclear weapons, unfortunately, uh, very powerful computers to do inferential searches and pattern recognition, which computers are quite good at, that will identify evildoers. <laughs> and evil doing patterns of behavior. And, and so far, I mean, what I've seen coming out of this so far has been really quite frightening. I mean, one of their evildoer searches they got the, the database from Safeway in California. And they did a, a general search to find out who was buying a lot of hummus. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Since terrorists eat hummus. <laughs> and hippies, but what the hell? You know, <laughs> if, you, if you sweep up a few hippies in the terrorist net, that's probably not such a bad thing. Well, you know, the effect of this on the ecology of cyberspace, I think, would be devastating. And here we are with this remarkable opportunity to create something that I think is genuinely holy, 
the global organism of mind in an explicit way, not collective unconscious, but the collective conscious. Here we are with an opportunity to make, make it so that every child on this planet has access to every, every bit of information that human beings have ever created. That, that a kid in, in the uplands of Uganda would be able to read any book in the Library of Congress. That is not a foolish dream. We have that as a possibility. But your government and your Congress is working very hard to stop this from happening, and you are letting them because you don't know that they're working very hard to stop this from happening. And I know you've got plenty to worry about at the moment, but I would strongly recommend that you bring yourselves up to speed on this. Because otherwise, you are going to be lousy ancestors. You know, I, I was thinking about what, what Nikki was saying earlier about the, the framers of the Constitution wanting to come up with a, a system of governance that would, that would be so wise in its understanding of human nature that it, would, that it would last for several hundred years, despite what they knew would be the profound technological changes that were likely to take place over that period of time. And I think that, you know, this is, this is a moment when we need to show even, even more wisdom than that. Because we are designing the foundations of the place where everyone's mind will live for the foreseeable future. And believe me, the architecture of that space will have a huge bearing on what can or cannot be thought, what human beings can conceive and imagine, how many filters our consciousness will have imposed on us, what we'll be able to think. And I can't think of anything that's more important to me. I can't think of anything that I might be doing that would be more important than trying to give my descendants the future that I'm talking about and to spare them the future that they're trying to build in, in, in Washington at the moment. So I, before we begin this conversation, I just want you to think about what it means to be a good ancestor in terms of how you relate to the development of digital technology and the politics that surround that area. Now, I have a feeling that many of you are a little computer wary. This is not about computers. It's about communication and it's about thought. And if you sort of get over the idea that there is something dehumanizing about technology and recognize that what technology is really about is connecting at its best, then I think that you can start to approach the matter right and you can become politically involved. I'm going to put in a I, I hesitate to do this, but I don't know anything else to suggest at the moment. Uh, I strongly recommend that you check out the Electronic Frontier Foundation and consider joining us. We're the only organization, basically, that's taking the government to court in these areas. And, it's, and we're a relatively small outfit, uh, and it's been tricky essentially taking on all the forces of the industrial period <laughs> Which is what's what's happening? I mean, you have you have industrialism arraying itself against uh, against the age that is dawned. You have in, 
and, and it's even more than industrialization. What you have is monotheism versus pantheism. You have a system of understanding authority that is a great white column with God on top and you on the bottom. And a whole lot of guys in the middle and none of them terribly nice. <laughs> the Pope and the CEO and your dad. Uh, and suddenly you've got this other thing forming which is a horizontal web of human consensus it's highly pantheistic where authority is something that has to be shared and, and derived in a web of, of uh, interaction it's a much more feminine environment and this you know I think is it's the first time that, that sort of the feminine distribution of power has had a shot anywhere in the, in the more developed parts of this planet since Abraham left Ur, <laughs> which was a while back. <laughs> and I may be a guy, but I'm in favor of this. And I hope you are too. And there are things you can do. So, I mean, if you have a computer and you have an online connection, go to www.eff.org. Those of you who have a computer in the room with a wireless card in it can do that right now. www.eff.org, Electronic Frontier Foundation. And if nothing else, you know, you can, you can find out more about what's going on there because you won't be able to find out about it in the papers. Because, you know, the papers actually are part of the media. And the media seek to own all information. So they're not going to tell you that there are people who think it would be a bad idea if they did. Besides, this stuff is tricky. I mean, I, can, I, I know that there are parts of you that are just saying, Jesus, is he going to talk to us about digital copyright? This is, you know, we're, we want profits. We don't want technologists. But I never claimed to be a prophet in the first place. Fortunately. I'm, I'm pretty good at predicting the present. <laughs> Which might seem like a fool's errand, but most people are busy predicting the past. <laughs> anyway, I think we have now... Where, where are we, time-wise? We have now reached a point where, uh, where I would hope that we could, we could start having some discourse. Uh, and, and we've got... Where's the, where's the person with the talking stick? Okay. There's a, there is a standing mic, though. If you're gonna, there's a standing mic right here, though. I, I, I ask you, if you're going to use the standing mic, do not line up behind it. Because what happens then is you get this, this completely out-of-sequence kind of conversation. By the time the person who's at the back of the line gets to the front of the line, the point they were going to make has been passed long since. So, so one person at a time at the standing mic, if you want to make a dive for it. And, and back there, there's a wireless mic. So uh, somebody put up your hand, and we'll, and we'll try to get you a talking stick. There's somebody's hand right there. I wish we had more wireless mics, but... Okay, what, as I understand it, what you're, what you're talking about is abrogating all the copyright laws and dissolving them. Is that correct? No, no. No, 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 no. Okay, then who, if everything is open Who do you free, work for? I uh, work for myself. Uh, no, I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm writing a book, and so, I mean... I'm, right. No, no, no. Look, first of all, up until recently, I was a Republican. Ditto. So, so I'm not, you know, I'm not a great enemy of property. I mean, you know, I saw what happened with the communists. I did, it didn't work that well. I, uh, my friend here says that it wasn't as bad as I think, but I, I still think it was pretty bad. Uh, but, you know, the term intellectual property is actually a very recently coined term. The idea that you own ideas is, is something that was not... I mean, Thomas Jefferson didn't believe you could, and he was the first patent commissioner, and he wrote the American copyright law. Uh, but, 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 no, 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 listen to me for a second. Okay. What, was, what was conveyed by copyright was a limited license 
a short-term license on a monopoly to distribute in physical form that expression. And now Congress is, is considering extending that. Oh, no, no, they're considering extending it. They've extended it to 175 years for institutions. I mean, Mickey Mouse, unless my colleague Larry Lessig wins his current case before the Supreme Court, Mickey Mouse will never become public domain in spite of the fact that he was taken, like all the other Disney characters, out of the public domain to begin with. Well, I thought at the, at the author's death, then it became... No, 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 no. See, the author no longer matters because, as you will probably find when you finish your book, you will probably not end up being the, quote, owner, unquote, of that expression. Your publisher will. And your publisher is not going to die that easily because it, it will either go on for a long time itself or it will sell that property, namely your book, to another publisher. Okay, I, I get you now. Question number two is how do you incorporate this thought of ending... Uh, free and open dissemination of information with Sheldrake's work and morphogenic learning. Uh, you need an explanation? No, 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 no. I, okay. I, no, I just had to. I'm, I'm, I just had to double clutch. <laughs> yeah, because when an idea evolves. And one yeah, person, yeah, yeah, no, no, you I know that. Right, okay. right, right, right. Well, see, now, Sheldrake, uh, Sheldrake, I think, you know, I'm not sure that he's right about the mechanism, but he's right about the result. Uh, and well, what about Rubik's cube? I mean, there's another illustration. Oh yeah, I mean, the Rubik's cube was invented in two different parts of the planet in the same two week period. I mean, a completely non-intuitive thing that, that, you know, it just happened that the Hungarian filed for a patent before the Japanese guy did. Uh, and my favorite example of this was, is the calculus, which is, you know, really non-intuitive as far as I'm concerned. Newton and Leibniz came up with the calculus at the same time. Newton spent the rest of his life trying to prove that Leibniz had ripped him off <laughs> and didn't do much good work after that. Leibniz figured it didn't make any difference who had come up with it. We had it, and he could go on and do other things. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there is obviously something in the field. And, and, and everything that I'm saying is, is pretty much in, in concert with what Rupert says uh, about the way in which mind actually works. Right, it's in the zero-point field, and then it's disseminated simultaneously right. everywhere. But, but the thing is that, you know, there are, there are plenty of things that you can do to inhibit that dissemination, and one of them is to claim to own it. And in trying to own it is in its self-destruction, isn't it? Well, I, it's destructive in the sense that, that information is a verb, like, like God and art. And if information is not moving, it ceases to exist. And if somebody is squatting on it in an act of ownership, they have destroyed it, in essence. And there's an enormous... I mean, one of the biggest concerns that I have about the content industry actually winning the current copyright wars... I mean, ultimately, I think they'll lose because there, there's something really fundamental about the desire to share information. But... You know, they could wipe out the last 150 years of stuff, which will, never, which will never get digitized, because it's owned by large institutions that refuse to allow it to be digitized. However, how about the influence of the underground still disseminating information clandestinely? That in itself is well, a but it, it's force again, too, you know, the, it? the, the government has come up with, you know, there's a, there's a bill in Congress at the moment. That would, that would change the Computer Fr uh, Crime and Abuse Act so that the content industry could actually shut down large parts of the Internet if they saw that there was, there was copyrighted material t uh, being transferred over the, over the wires. Yes, but they can never shut down right. all the servers, can Do we? they? Yeah, they can. Uh, Another question. Over here. Do you, do you draw some line on the limitations of free copyright. For example, songwriters would like to believe that they have... I saw a, her hand, but uh, hang on a second. Uh, oh, w wait a second. Oh, you, oh, there you are. 
You're using the standing mic. I'm sorry, Russell. Okay. Go but, ahead. But I'm, but I'm alone. But, but and hey, hey, Cody, this lady over yeah. here is next. Okay. Yeah. Where is she? Who? Over, over there. Raise your hand. I don't see right there. Oh, there you are. Go ahead, Russell. Sorry. As a songwriter, I'd like to believe that I have some ownership interest in the lyrics that I write, at least for some period of time before they get downloaded all and copied all over the internet. Because people who write songs and books want to derive some income from their efforts. Well, now, you where, may, do you, where do you draw as, the line? As you know, I, I, I have, I've made some efforts in that area myself. Uh, and, and let me tell you a story that is, that is illustrative. When, uh, back in the early 70s, I think it was, is that right, Nikki? When, when did we start letting people tape concerts? It was like 71, right? Something like that. Something, a long time ago. Anyway, it, was, it seemed like it had already been a long, strange trip at that point, but we didn't know long or strange. Uh, in any case, we realized that people were taping our songs. And we had the standard sort of industrial era attitude towards this, which was that they were ripping us off. Now, I've since come to realize that, you know, you can't steal something from somebody if he still has it. You know, it's not theft if, if the, the, the original owner is still in possession of it. But uh, So we, we, we thought they were thieves and they were stealing our songs and they were going to make them less valuable. Uh, and people wouldn't buy our terrible records, which they weren't much anyway. And, and so we kicked them out of the concerts. But, you know, it's, it's bad for your karma to be mean to a deadhead. They're, especially if you're the Grateful Dead. I mean, they're kind of a hapless lot. And, you know, even, even as, as hardened... And, and scaly as our consciences were by then, there was something about the baleful glances that these kids would, would cast toward the stage as they were being ushered out of the, out of the venue that got to us. So, so we decided that you know, we were going to go ahead and let them tape. You know, and sure, it would probably cost us a lot of money, but we weren't in it for the money anyway, which was an easy thing to say since we weren't making any. Uh, and the interesting thing that happened was that those tapes became like I think the first example I've ever seen of viral marketing you know they created a huge community of people that were deadheads you know that would pass around the, the, the scripture in, on audio cassettes and it you know not only was this not bad for us economically uh, by the time we actually died we could fill any stadium in America. We were the most, we were the highest grossing performing act in the United States. Now, I mean, we could fill any stadium in America largely by the efficiency of bringing our audience around with us. But, <laughs> but we could, you know? A lot of people couldn't do that. So, you know, and that's, I, I grant you, that's sort of an extreme case, but I'm not sure that it is. Because, you know, what most songwriters, the, the, the problem that most songwriters have is not anybody ripping them, ripping them off. It's not, I mean, outside the record companies, which do so all the time. Uh, it's, it's nobody ever listening. Nobody ever hearing. Producers have the idea that downloading songs from the Internet is responsible for the falling off of sales of CDs. No, think that's I, I think that's absolutely false. As a matter of fact, uh, I can show you a couple of graphs that were published in the New York Times last year that showed the, the uh, download rate through Napster and unit CD sales worldwide. As Napster became more popular, more CDs were sold. They peaked at exactly the same time. As soon as they killed Napster, CD sales started to fall. I mean, it seems fairly evident to me that Napster was actually increasing CD sales. You know, and then, uh, then of course, the record industry went out and, and did something that I think is bad business, which is systematically pissing off the audience and the artist. <laughs> I mean, and, and doing so, you know, without, without a qualm of conscience. Uh, but the, the thing about, 
about information that I think is important to note. It's very easy in, in you know, conventional economics to think that there's a relationship between scarcity and value because with diamonds there is. I mean, actually, diamonds would not be particularly valuable were it not for the fact that the De Beers Corporation owns practically all of them and is able to regulate them towards scarcity. Um, and it's, you know, you can think of a lot of things. Severable articles of property where if, if you've got it, I don't. That, you know, are more scarce, are more valuable when they're scarce. But, but it may be that with information, it's exactly the opposite, that there's a relationship between familiarity and value. Not necessarily for the information itself, but for the source of the information, for the mind that created it. So, I, I would say that we just need to, we need to rearrange our understanding of how economics works in this area. Wow. Okay. You seem like uh, a little bit of a, a renegade. Me? <laughs> just in terms of somebody, Republican. somebody from, who's looking at you, say, from what's taking place in our government. Um, specifically the Patriots Act, et cetera. I have a terrible confession to make, which is that I was Western Wyoming, I was Dick Cheney's Western Wyoming campaign manager when he ran for Congress. Oh. He wasn't a bad congressman. I wasn't thinking about him being in charge of the world. <laughs> so my question is this. Um, in light of you starting this organization, or it's been around for a while, um, I'm looking at the, the dilemma of um, realizing that my computer will, and all the information contained on it is potentially um, a view into my own world, okay? And uh, that, namely, there's computers that can run, you know, a spectrum of analysis on the information in my computer or scan it. Now, I'm not concerned they're going to pick on me or you or anybody in particular, but in a way there's a part of me that's thinking I don't want to give them any fodder for investigation or anything like that. I also don't want to live my life in a paranoid way, but at the same time, if we all stop doing you know, if we eliminated all those connections where we're speaking to one another about the information that is underground or the information that we, is not being revealed through the media, then the lines of communication are open. But if they're, if they're open, then and, they're... And, and if we all stopped speaking, we wouldn't have to worry about them taking away our freedom of expression. So, you know, in, in other words, I can, I can stand, you know, and have a conversation with somebody and share my ideas, and I believe you me, I do. But now I have a concern about storing those ideas and things that I've gotten from other people on my hard well, drive. Well, first of all, they can't get to your hard drive yet. They're trying, they are working on developing that ability. Microsoft and, and, and Intel are trying to do that, along, and, and they are being, there, there are uh, laws, uh, one of them is called UCEDA, uh, which, which would uh, mandate those kinds of, of uh, changes that would enable surveillance. Uh, but right now it's not true, and, and, and you know, I, I think that the answer is to stop this from happening and, and, and also to use, to use technology that is, is not vulnerable to this to the extent that Microsoft has already created. I mean, Windows XP is, is full of, of spook holes. Uh, that can look at, at what you're doing and report out. I wouldn't use Windows under any circumstances, to tell you the truth. Uh, so that's one, that's one part of it. But you have to reckon with the fact that in, in a digitized society, which this is, you are laying down a digital slime trail everywhere you go. Every transaction you engage in. And, and, you can, and this can be rolled up behind you and, and, and fluffed a little bit and turned into a, an incredibly accurate simulacrum of you. 
uh, which may not be of interest to them yet, but who knows what will become of interest to them after they start finding out how evildoers work. <laughs> well, what I'm, what I'm going to do is to try to make certain that the, that the Office of Information Awareness never, never achieves their, their total information awareness program, which is... Uh, and I've got my best people working on it. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I suppose I'll pray. Uh, but I mean, I'm doing everything I can to make sure that that, uh, that information is not being stored and cannot be, I mean, is not being stored commercially in a way that makes it accessible to the government. And, there are, and, and also is being encrypted so that it can't be easily discovered by other means. I mean, my organization fought a long-running battle with the United States government over encryption, which we finally won. So you can use you know, strong encryption to, to, I mean, if, you want, if you're really worried about the stuff that's on your hard disk, you can encrypt the whole damn thing, don't forget your password, so that nobody could ever read it quite easily. I mean, I, you don't have to be technically, technically adept to do that. I have an organization that is fighting really hard uh, at every possible level of, uh, you know, lobbying and, and court action to stop this from happening. So what can we do? Well, you know, be, make yourselves aware of what's going on. And as I say, I mean, it sounds self-serving, but joining EFF wouldn't hurt. Uh, okay, right back here. I, I wonder if I could help answer that question uh, on the personal computer level, uh, there are a couple things you can do. And uh, if you're going to Morpheus.com or Kaza is where your, your computer opens up information and you're sharing programs and files across the internet. You want to make sure that your settings are right so that you're not sharing your computer information. Uh, also, when well, you're no, but, 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 going to websites, you but can... Wait a second, wait a second. If, you, if, you're, if you're in a peer-to-peer -peer sharing system and you're not sharing, you're just taking... That doesn't sound like a good community to me. It isn't. So, so I, 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 can't, I can't support you on that one. So don't go to those sharing file uh, Well, sites. no. Uh, make, sure that, make sure that the file, the, the space on your computer that is being shared uh, is, is, you know, adequately cordoned off with, you know, proper security measures. All right. You know, don't use, don't use Windows. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot to ask. I know you're not going to be able to do that, but... Okay, and who else? Um, earlier you said that um, an idea was a life. Did you say that? It's a life form. I mean, I don't, I don't know the difference between an organism and an idea. And, and you said that information could be destroyed. Are you saying that ideas can be destroyed? Sure. So then life can be destroyed. I mean, oh, yeah. So then I God mean, can be destroyed. Well, I mean, there are a lot of life forms that have been destroyed. The fossil record is, you know, chock full of, of ideas that didn't quite make it. The brontosaurus was a great idea. But it's, you know, no longer current. So that's not a fear-based belief system? No, I mean, it's the natural evolution of things. I mean, I, you know... Uh, I think that, you know, things are, everything is in the process of being born and dying. Everything and every thought. Uh, I just, I think that there are some thoughts that are worth hanging on to as long as possible. I don't think that ideas can be destroyed, but I think they can be delayed. Well, you might be right about that. It's, it's, not, a, it's, it's not a bet I'm willing to place at the moment. I mean, because I, I, I do think that it's possible to c create so many limitations on human consciousness, you know, that people really cannot, cannot see or imagine certain things. I mean, you know, for example, the Arapaho Indians in the part of the United States that I come from, 
see, literally perceive these little green men. I swear to God, they see them. Uh, you know, they're about this tall. And they're covered with uh, long, sort of luminescent green hair. And they're really ugly. And they don't talk about it much because we can't see them. Because we don't believe they exist. To the Arapaho, they're, they're as real as rabbits. You know, that's just like a really vivid kind of filter that, that culture places on reality. Governments with the right kinds of controls, and believe me, the in- Internet could become the right kind of control, could make it so that you, you, know, you have a very limited aperture on, on the phenomena of the world. You know, your capacity to understand is, is deeply limited to what they want you to know. And, and this is already the case. I mean, consider the last election. You know, I mean, the, the people, people are now living in a state in the United States, you know, of such environmental pollution of the mind that they don't know the difference between experience and information. And, they, and, and, you know, and they're, making, they're making judgments on the threats in the world that are completely asynchronous with reality. I mean, the fact is that your, your chances of being killed by a terrorist now are considerably less than your chances of being killed by lightning while golfing. I mean, true, statistically. And yet we are, we are throwing out all the wise architecture that Nikki was referring to earlier in order to prevent our being killed by terrorists. I mean... I don't know if we would feel right about throwing out the Constitution to, to you know, get rid of the lightning and golfing problem. <laughs> but the media have created this awareness that is completely out of sync with what we experience. Because they live on the sale of fear. I mean, look at the media as an organism. That organism has as its natural ecology the sale of the attention, to the, the attention of the audience to the advertisers. That's all they're really doing. That's the bottom line. Unless it's NPR. In which case they're harassing you mercilessly for a couple of months. <laughs> but the, but the, the biological support model for most media in America is based on harvesting attention, which means that they want to elevate attention. right? And if you want to elevate attention, you want to fertilize attention the best thing you can do is to go right to the basics. You know, go right to the hypothalamus, the old reptile brain, and, and traffic in fear, violence, and sex. And so we now have this, this map of the world that we're, many of us walking around with that has, has a world that is much more dangerous, much more violent, and, you know, a lot more sexually charged than, the, than what we actually experience out on the street. And many of us don't experience much on the street because we're scared to go out there. <laughs> you know, the murder rate has been falling in the United States, plummeting, for the last 20 years. And people are more scared of being murdered than ever. Because the local TV channels, when they do their evening news, focus on... The, 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 the murder that was committed that evening. And there always is one. I mean, in any sort of sizable market. Uh, yeah, you. Or, oh, all right, and then you. So you talked about the um, slime trail, the data, the data slime trail. Then you also talked about um, the folks who were recording the shows and how you chose to turn that around and it ended up becoming one of the best marketing tools. So there are other questions that were about what to do, and I think that one of the things that we have to do is support your organization to get the word out to, you know, 5,000 people rather than just those of us who are here. Actually, if each of you would get the word out to a friend, it would be a start. Yeah, well, or 10 friends. But just, like... I mean, I think that one of the things that the government is trying to instill in us is that fear. Oh, sure. And so the biggest thing that we can do to change that is to say, sorry, I'm not afraid. I'm showing up. 
It's true. It's true. I, I mean, you know, the, the, I, I, I think that, you know, the reason that the soul comes into the world is so that, that love will make sense. Because love would, would be meaningless without fear. Uh, and, you know, we need to be properly appreciative of these bastards for their ability to help us learn how to love. That, that's what your organization is providing the service to us about, though. And so us taking that step and using your resource and networking, that's, that's you know, ultimately we take it further by your inspiration. Hope so. And we're grateful. Thank you. That's for sure. Who over here? I was going to say something really similar in terms of not living in fear with our computers because I only recently started using a cell phone and was just shocked one day when, you know, I'm standing in the middle of someplace strange and all of a sudden I can talk to somebody and it was very connective and it made me realize that, you know, pretty soon we won't need the cell phones. We'll just remember which frequency to tune into and be able to talk to that person. And so that's one of the things that I think about is that... I will be constantly remembering the wrong frequency, but go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) But I guess... One of the things that I jump to is I'm really deeply appreciative for people like you who are seeing a piece right now that needs to be addressed right now. But the big picture that I see is that somehow we have to combine our technological awareness with our spiritual awareness because we're, we're, we're moving beyond the technology. Yeah. And that is only going to happen from a place of love because yeah. from a place of, well, yes. I think it's possible to do it from fear, but it's going to reap I, differently. I don't think so. I really don't think so. I mean, uh, I, it depends on how you define technology, because I think there's psychic technologies that can be used. I, technolo- out of care, technology, but... you know, language is technology. Uh, I mean, any any tool that that can be used by a life form to to influence surrounding reality is technology. I guess I'm talking about internal technology is what we're beginning to tap into. Yeah. Whereas we been focused in the government and what you're looking at somewhat is more of an external But I, I, you know, I I really, you know, I I think it is absolutely critical to continue to to act out of of courage and love. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So I know of of a website that I've I've heard about. um, It's called spiritofma'at.com and one of the intentions that was, a lot of you probably know it, but one of the intentions was is to look at the inter- internet as our global brain and what kind of information do we want to be focusing on um, yeah. and doing that consciously. What do we want to collectively think about? Yeah. Uh, the, well, no, there, there's a lady right here, and she's closest, so out of expediency. But, but after that, there are a couple of people back there along that wall that... Is there a difference in being able to control computers that are run by fiber optics versus, say, satellite? No, bits are bits. Uh, it doesn't make any difference how, how data is being exchanged. It's all ones and zeros. And, you know, they can come down from satellites. They can, you know, uh, I have some friends at, at the MIT Media Lab that have come up with computers in their shoes that are actually powered by them walking. <laughs> These are very nerdy people. But, <laughs> but they, they are using their bodies as, an, as a network. So you can go up to somebody and shake their hand, and all the information that they want transferred out of their shoe will be transferred into the other person's shoe. <laughs> I don't know whether this works for spike heels or not. I'm trying to... Uh, Speaking of universities, when a person is employed by a university... They have to sign a waiver giving the rights of any ideas or inventions that they come up with to the university. Now, I usually think of people who come out of universities and professors as leaders (laughs) and leading thought people, and it doesn't seem to be really the case. Uh, That's optimistic. Would you comment on that? Uh, Well, I, I tend to, you know, my experience with academia is is different from yours, but uh, 
I, you know, I would, I would say that, you know, one of the, MIT, having taken that view for a long time, realized recently that they were in the, in the business of actually trying to create more knowledge in the world. And also, they also, they noticed that, that it had cost them a couple of years ago several million dollars more in legal bills to, to defend their intellectual property than it, than they were bringing in from it. Uh, and so they now have a policy of letting people disseminate and giving people the right to, to uh, you know, be be free with with what they what they create while they're at MIT. And I think that that's probably going to become the, the dominant system. With luck. I mean, there are a lot of problems in the universities at the moment regarding digital technology. I mean, nobody knows whether putting something on the web constitutes publication, whether you can get tenure that way. And it's, they're so stupid. Uh, but I, 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 I wouldn't, I can't imagine myself ever signing anything that would give somebody else the right to the contents of my head. And, I, and, I, and I'm just shocked that other people are willing to do that. I mean, there's got to be a better way to earn a living. Uh, there were a couple of hands back there on, along the wall. Cody, if you can. Hi, I just have a quick question. You said you wouldn't use Windows. If you don't use Windows, what do you use? I have a, I have a Mac. Uh, but it's you know it's also the case that you know Linux is getting easier and easier and and there are alternatives. Okay, uh, thank you. Is the Mac more secure? Yeah. Yeah, Mac, uh, Apple Apple is not is not uh, signing itself up for all these trusted uh, computing uh, are regimes. They, are those other systems getting so that they're more compatible with business applications? I, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of in business, and uh, <laughs> believe it or not, and and I and I exchange a lot of data with people that are, you know, still. Uh, uh, hey, Cody, there's another lady back there. For yeah, uh, you know, I, I create a lot of files, and you know, I unfortunately, I, 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 I am ashamed to admit that I use Microsoft Office, just because a lot of other people do, and. The stuff that I create on my Macintosh and Microsoft Office is easily opened by anybody with a Windows machine, and vice versa. And, and this is true. They're, they're, you, can, you can go to a universal file format like RTF, and you know, it always, it, it'll always cross-correlate. Yeah? Mr. Barlow, are you related to Maud Barlow of uh, Canada? You know, uh, I, she and I have tried to find that out. The reason why uh, it appears that we are, but somewhat distantly. I mean, her, uh, our, there's a point where both of our families were in upstate New York, but mine went off with the Mormons in, in uh, about the 1840s or 30s, and, and hers moved north into Canada. Well, she's with the International Forum on Globalization, which yeah. I have supported for a long time. Yeah. But she's, I'm sure she's, she would understand my question to you. Yeah. Well, we, we, we went up in the same saucer, I'll say that. Oh, good. <laughs> well... Since you're fairly uh, uh, some kind of a genius as far as cyberspace is concerned, I have a very... Oh. Hey, don't you, don't lay use. that on me. Well, I've got to lay it somebody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking. I, I, traveled a uh, lot come, I traveled a lot to come here to meet a lot of people that, are, that are, make some sense of what's going on in this planet because I don't like what's going on, what America is doing outside. No. Now, how are we going to use cyberspace to prevent this war from happening, sir? You know, that's... Now a, we have a vice a, president and a president who are both oil millionaires. Yeah, but, uh, it's a really an interesting question because I used to think that, you know, the great thing about the Internet was that it would give everybody a, uh, a voice. Well, it turns out at the moment that, the, that the, the worst thing about the Internet is that it gives everybody a voice. Well, no, no, hear me out. I mean, what I just recently realized is that there's an awful lot of energy that would ordinarily, in you know, times past, would go into organizing, you know, large groups of people. 
with leaders and agendas and you know, uh, the capacity to, to make campaign donations, which is where it really comes down, uh, that is now being devoted to being a lonely pamph uh, pamphleteer on some corner of cyberspace. I mean, there are a million or 20 million howling voices all around cyberspace saying the same thing that you and I feel and they are not being heard at all by, by government, and they have no means of making themselves heard because the only way in which those institutions recognize power is if the power is organized enough to do something to them, preferably something that involves money. I mean, uh, you're... We got lots of energy, but probably not enough money. Well, so how do, I mean, we defeated the World Bank, 30 so we're gonna kill ourselves if the World Bank makes uh, something and they stop. So how do we do this? We have all these people who say we don't want war. Well, first of all, you know, it's hard to make a war if nobody will fight it. And, you know, we, we have to be a lot more dedicated to trying to get the people right around us to be unwilling to engage in that activity. Uh, you know, personally, I... I think that it would, it would be a great start if people would just vote. I mean, here we, here we are you know, at, at an incredibly pivotal point in American history. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they just eliminated in the last election, they eliminated the American Republic and started the American Empire. And, you know, here we are, we're having what may well be the last free election or so-called free election in the United States. We just did. I mean, the, by the next time an election rolls around, we could be in a state of national emergency where it would just be wrong to get us, give us the vote. But I don't know why they'd bother, because the only people who bothered to vote this time were the ones who agreed with them. Be, well, apparently... Well, this, I, know, I know you voted, but you know, not enough of you did. I mean, this reminds me of my old mother who, uh, who in 1996 said, you know, everybody told me that if I voted for Barry Goldwater, we'd be in a land war in Asia by now, and I voted for Barry Goldwater, and we're in a land war in Asia. <laughs> no, I mean, we, it, it, there was the lowest voter turnout in the history of, of elections in America this last go-round. So a lot of people who feel the way you and I feel didn't vote. And I don't know why. Uh, let's see, there, the fella. I've always thought of music as a healing medium, and I'm sure a lot of other people do as well. And with the advent of the. You never heard the dead Kennedys, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> With the advent of the CD, uh, the quality of music began to go down, and the, and the spectrum that is heard is, was lower. Now with the advent of MP3, it's even worse. It's a pitiful representation of what the real music is. Do you see that as a problem, and do you see a solution for the slide of the quality of music and its ability to be a healing power? Well, reality is analog. Yeah, right. Uh, and, you know, I don't... I don't imagine that the time is going to come anytime soon when, you know, music coming directly from an instrument and hitting your eardrum is going to go away. Uh, in terms of distributing music, I'd imagine that everything's going to get digital. And I sort of feel like, you know, no matter how high the bit sampling rate, you're still slicing reality up into, into strange little chunks. But, you know, you can slice it up into enough chunks that it starts to sound kind of real. I agree with that, but it's going in the other direction. That's well, no, I mean, MP3, I think, MP3 is a very temporary uh, solution. I mean, it, it would just, it was a way of dealing with a couple of things that are going to go away. One of them is, is limitations on bandwidth. Well, that, the one po positive thing may be that DVD sound will be, have a higher sampling rate. Yeah, but, and, and, you know, and this is, this is all happening pretty fast. I mean, you know, you've got several things going on that are, you know, exponential scales. Uh, processor speed, bandwidth, and storage. I mean, I, uh, I've got a, a 30 gigabyte hard disk in my computer here that's, you know, smaller than a pack of cigarettes. And I could get another one just like it for, for 200 bucks 
first time I bought a hard disk, I bought it for $1,100 and it was 10 megabytes. And that wasn't that long ago. You know, so things are going on. And, and bandwidth is the same thing and, and processor is the same thing. So I, you know, bits are going to come at you fast enough so that they eventually will se seem kind of real. But as I said, there's a big difference between experience and information and there always will be. Thank God. Uh, geez, uh, you. This is completely arbitrary. How effective is it to call the president's office or congresspeople and, and express your opinion? <laughs> is it at all? I've done that a few times recently. Well, I had one, I had one congressman tell me that before the, before the War Powers Act vote, calls were running into her office at the rate of uh, 30 to 1 against, and she still voted for it. So, I, you know, do the math. I, is it, does it make sense to call? I, it, it probably is a good, yeah, it makes sense to call because it's the right thing to do. Will it actually make a difference? I would say not, unless, unless you happen to have made a $10,000 campaign donation, in which case it will. Now, and then right here. Uh, actually, Cody, I'll tell you what. Uh, go Her, but uh, right there. But you have actually a better view of the audience than I do. Oh, I'll, I'll do it. And, and, and we're both going to be completely arbitrary, so. I was wondering about where you get all your information from. I'm always looking to get a better website or um, source of information, and I was wondering if you could give us a few examples. I make most of it up, but... Uh, <laughs> No, I, I don't know where I get my information from. That's, that's one of the indicators that I have that mind is, is like not something that I have. I, I, you know, <laughs> information, you know, you live in a sea of information. And I, and I get it from a lot of different places. I've been online for a long time. And, and uh, I get a huge amount of mail from people every time they see something that they think I ought to know about, I, I hear about it. And, you know, my bandwidth is a little, I mean, my personal I.O. is sort of weak. I wouldn't buy a modem that, that processes text information as fast as I do. But, you know, I, I sort of keep up with things. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that actually a great way to keep up with information is conversation with the right people. Though, I mean, you have to, you have to make sure that, the, that you know, you're, you're not falling into one of these little reality distortion fields. <laughs> which are common, where the only people you're talking to are the ones that are breathing the same gases that you are. Uh, you got to be, you got I mean, it, again, the mind is like any ecosystem. It, it, it's much better if it's diverse. So cultivate, cultivate the, the, the close acquaintance of a lot of people of differing opinions and viewpoints and, and experiences and, and find out what they're thinking and what they think is important. We have time for a couple more questions. Or answers, if you got some. Um, you, said, um, <laughs> you said we're designing the space where everyone's mind will live for the foreseeable future or something like that. And you know, I think all this concern about immediate personal safety and organizing is really important, but we're kind of reacting. And it seems like with that statement, we have an opportunity to get proactive, like architects, and try and design a space that works and makes these negative floods divert. That's absolutely and, correct. Um, I know we don't have time to, I mean, there's probably a lot we could, it's probably what we're doing this weekend, is trying to create an architecture of openness, of a, of a free open space. I wonder if you just quickly, do you have any, you know, ideas I, about where this, where we can see examples of this architecture and what? Not? Well, I mean, uh, just in general, I, you know, I assume that anything that connects is holy and anything that separates is sinful. Uh, it's that simple. And, and openness is paramount. So, you, you know, you, obviously, as in life, there have to be some standards that naturally evolve. But anytime you see somebody trying to impose standards to suit some purpose or another, whether it's you know, fighting terrorism or combating child pornography or protecting intellectual property, I don't care what it is. Be very afraid and stop them. Because the, the, 
online, you know, it's one continuous web of information. And if you can control any aspect of it, you can control all of it. So the architecture has to be completely free and open and redundant. I mean, the cool thing about the internet, the way that it was originally designed, I mean, it was designed so as to have an information system that could not be decapitated by nuclear attack or disabled. Though I once talked to the guy who created packet switch networking, which, which was the, what the internet uses, so that you don't have to have central switches that are easily taken out. And I said, were you actually thinking about a, a system that couldn't be decapitated, or did you have a political agenda? And he said, well, I was thinking about a system that didn't have a head. <laughs> so if you see somebody trying to transplant a head onto the internet, you know that they're up to no good. Uh, that's the kind of, ar you, the architecture you want is, is completely distributed. And, you know, we could get into much more technical detail, but I think we'd bore the hell out of people. And I, you and I can talk about this offline. Or online. Uh, by, by the way, my, my email address is barlow at EFF.org. And I don't respond to everything I get, but I do read it in my way. Yeah. I like Linux and a lot of things that the young hackers did. Uh, my son was, in a positive sense, was hacking into like NASA when he was 13 and what have you. <laughs> I might have been uh, defending it. <laughs> so uh, do you think that they are coming up with any technology? You talked about the encryption. Uh, you must talk to these people. Do they have some idea? Because as my son said once to me, I said, how can you always beat these other people? And he said, because they only know how to do what they get paid for. We you know well, how that, it works. That's right. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, ultimately, Ultimately, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put my bets on a smart 15-year-old over a 50-year-old over a guy on a salary any day. Especially a, a smart 15-year-old who wants to violate the forbidden. There's <laughs> a lot of force there. So, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, your son is, your son is right, but the, but the problem is that you can, so, you can so alter the system that it cannot be hacked. And... Uh, you know, the, 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 the institutions are getting better and better at, at hiring people like your son instead of the usual wage slit. I mean, I know in a lot of kids that would be hackers now that are working for the NSA. Is, is there a technological way to protect us from them being able to create a head? Yeah, I, the, people are working on it, but it, you know, it's it's getting it's getting harder and harder. If especially if the major chip manufacturers are designing the chip into the very fundamental nature of the processor, which is what they're trying to do at the moment. They're trying to close the architecture of the processor itself. So, yeah, I mean. Uh, I think it's there are usually ways around it, but it's but it's getting it's getting trickier. Uh, right, we are over time, and you know anybody who wants to discuss these issues with me uh, more can do so. I'll be around all weekend, and uh, thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Enjoy, share, and spread the word. And visit us online at greatmystery.org.